today. The conversation with the CEOs of Walmart and Target focused on how they are working to stock shelves, including in rural areas, and any regional disparities they are seeing. And the President asked what more his team can do to help move product and get more product to those communities. He also announced additional steps to get infant formula onto store shelves as quickly as possible without compromising safety. These steps include cutting red tape to get more infant formula to store shelves quicker by urging states to provide cus consumers flexibility on the types of formula they can buy with WIC dollars, calling on the FTC and state attorneys general to crack down on any price gouging or unfair market practices related to sales of infant formula, like third-party sellers reselling formula at steep prices, and increasing the supply of formula through increased exports imports. The Biden-Harris administration will uh, continue to monitor the this situation and identify other ways we can dis support the safe and rapid increase in the production and distribution of baby formula. Uh, today we also mark, and you heard the President do this this morning, a tragic milestone in the United States, one million lives lost due to COVID-19. Our hearts go out to those grieving, a loved one, and those families forever changed because of the pandemic. As the President said this morning, we cannot grow numb to the urgency of this crisis. It is critical that we honor those who have been lost by doing everything we can to prevent as many deaths as possible. You saw that this morning from, uh, from the President as he kicked off the COVID-19 summit. Today's summit highlighted American leadership in action. Together with our co-hosting nations, we, uh, we united the world to commit to vaccinating, the, uh, to vaccinating the world, saving lives, and building better health security with an inspiring response. We rallied $3 billion from other nations, more than three, about 3.2 at this point in time, still counting, uh, from other nations and partners around the world to address the global response. And the President issued a stark warning about our ability to continue fighting COVID globally if Congress fails to act. As we heard through the summit, now is not the time for complacency. We need Congress to show up, not with empty words, but with action to fight COVID at home and abroad. As we mark this tragic milestone, our hope is to avoid another tragic one like this, uh, and that will only come if we act with urgency uh, throughout the remaining fight against the pandemic. Go ahead, Josh. Thanks, Jen. Uh, two questions. First, on the baby formula. Abbott says once the FDA gives them notice, it will take them two weeks to restart the site and then an additional six to eight weeks to get formula on the shelves. With what the President heard today, does he believe that we'll have the tools to bridge what could be a two-month-plus shortage? Well, I would say that the President is going to continue to use every tool we have in order to bridge that gap. And this has been work that has been underway for weeks and months now. Uh, we know uh, that as if, if they get approval, obviously, as you noted, it will take them some time to get up and running again. So what we need to do and what you've seen the president announce earlier today, and I just reiterated, is steps we can take from here to increase supply, make sure it's on the shelves. That includes increasing imports. It also includes ensuring we're working with retailers, as the president did during his calls, to make sure that shelves are stocked. It also includes ensuring that lower income families can access different brands of baby formula uh, by working through with the WIC to, for the exemptions for the WIC program. So uh, we recognize uh, that this is um, certainly a challenge for people across the country, something the President is very focused on, and we're going to do everything we can to cut red tape uh, and, uh, and um, take steps to increase supply on the marketplace. Secondly, uh, AAA is saying, you know, record high nominal gasoline prices again today, and, but Americans are also seeing news about uh, oil leases and auctions not going forward. What was the administration's thinking on not having those uh, options? Well, uh, the Department of Interior, who they have put out some uh, comments on this, and what they have made quite clear is that the Cook Inlet cancellation, which you're referring to, was due to a lack of industry in interest, uh, and the Gulf sales were as a result of delays due to a number of factors, including conflicting court rulings. So those were the two areas where you've seen um, the, the um, pause. Um, but there was not interest. I would note that if we take a step back and look at what is available out there and look at the supply needed, as you noted at the top of, at the, as part of your question, leasing and production offshore is a lengthier process. Uh, it can take up to 10 years to create supply. So let's start there. Secondly, of the more than 10.9 million offshore acres currently under lease, industry is not producing on 8.26 million acres. That's about 7.75, more than 75 percent that is non-producing. Of the 
9 million onshore acres under lease. Industry is not producing on 12.3 million acres. That's almost 50 percent. And there are also over 9,000 onshore permits that have been approved and are waiting to be used onshore. So just to reiterate, while we expect uh, U.S. production is expected to increase by over 1 million barrels uh, a day this year and hit a new record uh, record uh, next year. Uh, this sp specific actions were as a result of lack of industry in interest and a uh, um, and uh, conflicting court rulings. You, uh, and sort of the bottom line is, you know, on formula, this is a problem. I mean, I think other parents here in the room can probably attest. I myself went to three stores this morning, still haven't found what what we need. When will parents be able to get the formula they need? What is your best sense of when store shelves will be stocked again? Well, I think it's also important to note that the reason we're here is because the FDA took a step to ensure that babies were uh, taking safe formula. There were babies who died from taking this formula, so they were doing their jobs. We have been working, this administration has been working for weeks now to address in anticipation of where we thought there could be shortages. Uh, we have also seen uh, an increase over the last four weeks of uh, supply available, which hasn't been an increase over the four weeks prior to the recall. That is a good sign. But obviously the steps the president took today are an acknowledgement and a recognition that more needs to be done, that we do not want parents, mothers, families out there to be stressed and worried about feeding their babies. That is why the president today had conversations with the CEOs of Walmart and Target, why he had conversations with Reckitt and Gerber about efforts to increase production, why we're taking steps to ensure that we are uh, making a, a, a we are uh, making WIC dollars available to a range of other supplies. So we're working. We're seeing increases over the last couple of weeks. More needs to be done. We're going to cut every element of red tape we can cut. We're going to work with manufacturers. We're going to import more uh, to expedite this as quickly as possible. But if you are a parent who's looking for formula right now, struggling to find what you need, do you have a, a, even a rough guess of how long these shortages are going to last? What should parents be bracing for here? Well, we've already seen an increase in supply over the past couple of weeks. What we are seeing, which is in enormous problem is hoarding. Uh, people hoarding because they're fearful. Uh, that is one element of it. And people hoarding because they are trying to profit off of fear, fearful parents. So that is also something we're focused on uh, taking efforts to track and adjust uh, uh, and address and, and look into. Um, but again, more infant formula has been produced in the last four weeks than in the four weeks preceding the recall. We're taking every step to increase that. So our message to parents is we hear you. We want to do everything we can. And we're going to cut every element of red tape to help address this and make it better for you to get formula on the shelves. And as you mentioned, you know, this obviously stems from the FDA taking necessary steps to try and deal with a very serious problem. And, and as Josh noted, you know, Abbott says that subject to FDA approval, they could restart at this site within two weeks. Do you have a sense of why it may be taking so long to get this factory back up and running or, or what the holdup is from the FDA's perspective? I would point you to the FDA, but again, I'd go back to why this decision was made in the first place, which was to save babies' lives and the FDA is not going to approve manufacturing again unless they are certain of the safety. Go ahead. Um, when the president spoke with um, Philippines President-elect Ferdinand Marcos last night, did they discuss either the uh, dispute with China in the West Philippine Sea or the um, court, U.S. court judgments against the president-elect? I'm not aware of those being a part of the discussion, but I can check and see uh, after the briefing if there's more details. Thank you. And then on um, NATO, um, if Finland and Sweden are successful in their attempts to join NATO, that would put the U.S. on the hook, again, for military uh, uh, defending um, those countries, um, even potentially with nuclear weapons. Um, what benefit is that to um, U.S. citizens? Well, first let me say that um, we would support, the United States would support a NATO application by Finland and or Sweden should they choose to apply. We of course will respect whatever decision they make. Uh, both Finland and Sweden are close and valued defense partners of the United States and of NATO. I would note that even without them being members of NATO, uh, our militaries have worked together for many years. We're confident that we can find a ways to work with them, address any concerns either country may have about the period now or whatever re is required if they they were to join NATO. Uh, I would say in terms of how this benefits 
um, the American people, I think is sort of what you're asking about. Um, having a strong NATO alliance, a strong Western alliance, which is a defensive alliance, by the way, uh, is good for our security around the world. And certainly having a strong partnership uh, with a range of countries, including Sweden and Finland, if they decide to join, is, is should be uh, reassuring to the American people about our own security interests. And then finally, when the president visits uh, South Korea next week, yeah. um, does he intend to visit the demilitarized uh, uh, zone? Um, and what's your current assessment of uh, the threat uh, of a North Korean nuclear test? Uh, well, on the first question, we're still finalizing details of the schedule for the trip and what it looks like. Obviously, that is a step that is taken by many who visit uh, the region, uh, but I expect we'll have uh, our national security advisor here in the briefing room next week with Corrine uh, to preview uh, the trip. Um, in terms of whether we expect a, t a test, uh, we, the United States assesses that the Democratic Repub People's Republic of Korea could be ready to conduct a test there as early as this month. This would be its seventh such test. We've shared this information with allies and partners and are closely coordinating with them. As you noted, the president is traveling to the Republic of Korea and Japan uh, ne in next week, uh, where he will continue strengthening these alliances and make clear our commitment to the security of the Republic of Korea. Uh, our intelligence assessment is consistent with the DPRK's recent public statements and destabilizing actions, including the test launch of multiple intercontinental uh, ballistic missiles. But this is information, again, we've shared uh, with our partners and allies, and of course will certainly be a topic of discussion when the president travels next week. Go ahead. Just uh, one more on the baby formula sure. shortage. Um, obviously, some parents are feeling panicked and they're feeling desperate, and a big reason for that is because there's no substitute for formula if you don't have access to breast milk. I'm just wondering, if you're a parent today and you go to the store, you can't find any formula on the shelves, um, as is being reported across the country, what, what is the step that they should take? What is the administration's guidance on the immediate step they should take? Is there a hotline that they can call? Should they take the baby to the hospital? What should they do? Well, I would say those are important public health questions, but what I can report on here, or what I can convey to all of you is what we're doing to address exactly that concern, which is uh, taking every step we can to ensure there is supply on store shelves. And we have increased the supply over the last four weeks. And as the president, uh, as I noted at the top of this briefing, we're gonna take every step we can to cut red tape to, uh, to ensure we're working with uh, with uh, retailers like Walmart and CEO, like that we're working with uh, Reckitt and Gerber and others who can produce more to ensure we are getting supply out to stores and out to retailers so that parents don't have that concern. Uh, but uh, beyond that, that's what I can uh, read out for all of you from here. Since you said it was a public health question, which agency should that question be directed to? Just the very practical, immediate question of if you can't find formula and you need it for your baby to eat, what should they be doing? Uh, we would certainly uh, encourage any parent who has concerns about their child's health or well-being to call their doctor or pediatrician. One more. Um, yeah. Just quickly on the student loan debt cancellation, can you give us a sense of whether the president is any closer to making a decision and just sort of his frame of mind as he's thinking about what amount he would be willing to cancel? Well, I think as I've mentioned in here before uh, on the campaign, when he was talking about student uh, loans, he talked about uh, a frame of about $125,000 a year. That is not related to necessarily what this final policy will look like, but I've used that as a point of reference to remind everyone, some who covered the campaign and some who did not, that he's always felt it should be targeted, this type of relief, and focus on the people who need help the most. I don't have an have any update on a final decision. I would remi remind you all that, uh, again, not, no one has paid a dime in federal uh, student loans since the president took office, and he's continuing to consider a range of options and, and policy here. Go ahead. Uh, on, on the formula shortage, just two quick ones. You said that this has been something that's been in the works for several months, mostly through the FDA. When was the first time the president was briefed on the shortage? <laughs> I'm not going to get into internal briefings. He's been made aware of it through the process. And there's been steps. It would have been, yes. Has there been any consideration of using the Defense Production Act? There are, a range of, there are a range of options, including that under consideration, Ed, but I would note the issue here is that a manufacturer was taken offline because they did not produce a safe baby formula. So uh, what we're doing here at this point in time is working with other manufacturers who can produce safe baby formula, and we've had success in increasing uh, our productivity, their productivity, over the last four weeks, and we're going to continue to work on that. He would have known about this before this week. It wasn't like this suddenly popped up. This has been something the administration has been working on for some time now. 
On Ukraine, um, Senator Rand Paul has delayed passage of the aid for Ukraine by insisting a new inspector general be established to track how the taxpayer money is being spent on the war. Uh, it's going to delay passage of this probably now until next week. Would the president support establishing some kind of watchdog office to track this? We've asked about this before. It's now a congressional issue. Well, I would say that we agree oversight is critical. That's why the package already includes millions of dollars to support additional oversight measures, including additional funding for existing inspectors general. And we encourage all senators to promptly pass the bill as it stands. We feel what's in there is sufficient. And one other thing that was left out of it, at least in the House, was an attempt to legalize the status of tens of thousands of Afghan evacuees brought into the U.S. last yeah. year. Does the White House see opportunity somewhere else soon to convince Congress to get that across the finish line? We have been having conversations with congressional leadership about this. Uh, they are ongoing on the best path forward for this and other priorities that were not included in the package. Uh, we know this, this bill sends a clear message to Ukraine, to Russia, and to the world that we stand with the people of Ukraine. It doesn't mean every component of it has everything we want in it, uh, including that as an example. But it's important to move it forward. Go ahead, Jackie. Thank you, Jen. Uh, a couple of quick follow-ups on baby formula, sure. and I want to get to something else. Uh, it does seem like we should have seen this coming, that maybe the FDA could have done more on the baby formula shortage. The whistleblower who used to work at that Sturgis plant warned the FDA top officials uh, about safety concerns in October, but they didn't interview that whistleblower until December. The inspection wasn't until January 31st. The recall happened February 17th. So is that timeline acceptable to the White House? And if not, what is the White House doing to correct that at the FDA? I'm sure there will be plenty of time to take a look at if there are any issues that could have been improved here. I don't have any specific analysis of that at this moment in time. What I will note is that there has been work ongoing on this for months. That's how we increase the uh, the supply uh, and how we're able to uh, you know, increase the sales based on the month of April overall. Um, but there's more that needs to be done. Clearly, we don't want any parent to fear about not being able to provide formula to their child. And as I noted at the top, the president is uh, you know, leaving no stone unturned in addressing this. I didn't see anything in the fact sheet related to possible antitrust <coughs> concerns. Uh, according to one report, 89% of the market's controlled by four companies. You know, the president has tried to increase competition in other areas mm -hmm. where it's consolidated, like meatpacking. Uh, so is there going to be any uh, call for increased competition in that industry coming from the White House? Uh, Jackie, it's a good question. I have not been made aware of that being a concern here, but I'm happy to raise it and see if there's more to tell you. Uh, shift gears only slightly to sure. truck pipes. Um, okay. You said in February that no money from a $30 million uh, harm reduction program would fund distribution of crack pipes in safe smoking kits. The Washington Free Beacon uh, reported that they went to harm reduction facilities in five cities and all of those facilities had crack pipes in their kits. Um, HHS would not say which uh, programs had applied for funding and the recipient list is not out yet. So I'm just wondering if the White House can say if any taxpayer dollars paid for these crack pipes. No federal funding has gone to it. And is there any oversight to ensure that when that money goes out for the program <coughs> that these organizations will not use federal dollars for crack pipes? This policy does not allow for crack pipes to be included. I would just note that this is a bit of a conspiracy theory that's been spread out there. It's not accurate. There's important drug treatment uh, programs for people who have been suffering from what we've seen as an epidemic across the country, and money is not used for crack pipes. And I want to ask about yeah. the President's uh, comments last night. He went off about MAGA again. Yeah. Um, MAGA King. Yes, King he MAGA. To, to uh, former President Trump as the ultra MAGA king. He's been decrying ultra MAGA Republicans and saying he's going to be doing it more. Mm -hmm. um, but Hillary Clinton expressed some regret not too long ago uh, for referring to Trump voters as deplorables who couldn't be redeemed. And considering that Trump got 74 million votes in the last election, I'm just wondering if this is the best strategy for Biden to win people over, win over support ahead of the midterms, especially given his inaugural theme being America United. Well, I would say that the president is not afraid to call out what he sees as extreme positions that are out of line with where the American people stand. And whether that is uh, supporting a tax plan that will raise taxes on 75 million Americans making less than $100,000 a year, or whether it is uh, supporting efforts to overturn Roe v. Wade, something that two-thirds of the American people in, in a Fox News poll, may I add, supported. Um, and there are countless examples from there. 
Uh, the President believes that there is still work we can do together. The Bipartisan Innovation Act is a good example of that. Uh, but again, he is not going to stand back and stand aside while people are pushing for extreme positions that are not in the interests or supported by the vast majority of the American people. Inflation today, Ro Khanna just sort of feeding into his comments about last night, about, from last night about inflation. Uh, the President was talking about the economy when he was referring to ultra MAGA. And um, Ro Khanna said today uh, that blaming Putin may not be effective. Um, he said, we need to say inflation's a real threat, it's an emergency. Uh, so it seems like the president has been rationing up this rhetoric, you know, blaming Republicans, blaming Putin. We've heard all of the reasons why the pandemic is a factor. Um, but Ro Khanna is asking, you know, this White House to call inflation an emergency and to call out the National Guard to help with supply chains. Are those things that you'd consider this White House would Jackie, consider? I don't think anyone doesn't think inflation is an issue. The president has said that countless times. The question is, it doesn't matter what you call it. The president just gave a speech on it yesterday. The issue, the question is, what is your plan to address it? He laid out a very a multi-part plan yesterday. He has taken a range of steps, including steps and even announced this week to lower the price of high-speed internet for tens of millions of Americans, to give farmers the tools and resources they need to boost production, to lower the deficit, something that happened on his watch last year, which will help, to release one million barrels of oil uh, from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, to fix the family glitch. What is the plan on the other side? We all recognize it's a problem, but if you open the cupboard door, there's nothing there, and that's the issue. Go ahead. Jen, the Flags are flying at half staff above the White House and at federal locations across the country. Uh, Kristen Urquiza, her dad died in June of 2020. You likely know he was in an Arizona yeah. hospital. The only person there to hold his hand in the ICU was the nurse. Uh, she is now the founder of a group called Marked by COVID. They have about 100,000 members right now. They're advocating for a national day of remembrance, a COVID Memorial Day of sorts. Does the president support a national day of remembrance, a COVID Memorial Day? Well, Peter, I would say that we're still in a fight against COVID, in a battle against COVID. Uh, there are still far too many people getting sick, getting hospitalized, and dying. And this is not the last time we will commemorate or the last step that the president will take to commemorate, but I don't have anything to predict about the future. I imagine the same applies to a COVID monument, right? You don't have any decisions made on that. Those are all important questions, and as the president said before, uh, people who have lost loved ones, uh, obviously a million lives have been lost. There are a lot of people across this country still in mourning. He recognizes that. We need to continue to commemorate that, but we're still at fight uh, in a fight with the virus. So on this day, one million American lives lost an unimaginable figure only two plus years ago. At 400,000 lives lost the president, then president-elect and vice president-elect were there at the Lincoln Memorial, 400 lights, 400,000 lives. For 500,000 lives lost, there was a moment of silence on the South Lawn. Today was a bit different. His only public comments were pre-recorded remarks to the global COVID summit. I guess I'm asking why not a more prominent remembrance for today's anniversary, for well, today's I would say first market. the president publicly addressed uh, this day and marked it. We also lowered uh, the flags for five days. They will be lowered for five days, and we will continue to mark and commemorate the lives lost. What people care about the country, though, most is our action and what actions the president will continue to take. And obviously, since he took office, according to a Yale study, it's estimated we've saved over 2.2 million American lives and 900 billion in health care costs. There's more work that needs to be done, more work to fight misinformation, more work to get more people vaccinated, and action is what people care about. People care about transparency, as you indicate as well. So my last question on this topic is, can you help people better understand what data Dr. Ashish Jha was pointing to when he warned that the U.S. could potentially see a hundred million infections in the U.S. if COVID relief isn't passed now over the course of the fall and winter waves expected. Uh, there's a range of studies that are ongoing. Dr. Jha talks to a range of people internally, health experts, and externally, and this is in the range of what they have conveyed to him directly. And I expect there'll be more studies that come out in the coming months. Go ahead. Thanks, Jenna. As you know, North Korea is on lockdown because of a, a case of uh, COVID there. Just one case. Yeah. Remarkable. Um, the country <laughs> the country has previously rejected um, offers from COVAX for vaccinations. I'm wondering if the White House um, will launch a renewed push to try to get vaccines to North Korea. Obviously, 
um, almost their entire population or their entire population has not been vaccinated. Yeah, you're right. And, and as you noted, um, the DPRK has repeatedly refused uh, vaccine donations from COVAX. We do not, the United States does not currently have plans to share vaccines with the DPRK. We do continue to support international efforts aimed at the provision of critical humanitarian aid to the most vulnerable North Koreans. And this is, of course, a broader part of the DPRK continuing to exploit its own citizens by not accepting this type of aid. As you know, it's not just uh, vaccines, it's also a range of humanitarian assistance that could very much help uh, the people in the country. And instead, they divert resources uh, to build their unlawful awful nuclear and ballistic missiles programs. But yes, we support international efforts, no current plans for the U.S. to donate you know, from the United States supply. And then just briefly on crypto, as you know, the crypto market is in something of a tailspin. Um, there's been an executive order that was put out in March to look into regulations and, and study the issue. Does, does the process need to be sped up now? given what we're saying. Well, that was significant at the time. I know it was, you know, only about two months ago um, because there had not been an acknowledgement about the need to look into crypto, both the benefits and the challenges. Um, and it's an ongoing effort uh, to do exactly that. I know that those who are running it from the Department of Treasury and, and otherwise want to make sure it's thorough and that they're assessing both of those uh, important questions, the opportunities and the challenges. So I would point you to them on when, whether there could be any effort to expedite or whether that's possible. Rory who is from Nick News. I know Rory. We've met. Rory, go ahead. Hi, I just have a question and a follow-up. So first, there are concerns about the negative impacts of social media on the mental health of children. Will the White House take any actions to prevent these adverse effects? <coughs> Uh, as a mom myself, Rory, uh, my daughter's younger than you. She'd think you were very hip and cool, no, no doubt. Um, uh, this is a huge concern that I have, we have, the president has, is the impact of social media platforms, their enormous power, and the fact that it is largely unchecked. Um, it is certainly something that our uh, Surgeon General, uh, Dr. Vivek Murthy, has talked about in terms of the impact of social media platforms and what the impact they're having on the mental health, uh, the, um, the self-esteem of young people. Uh, and so I would say the President, the First Lady, all of us believe that more needs to be done. And the Internet has become a tool for children's education. A lot of students use the Internet to learn. So how will the White House prevent children from getting misinformed from the Internet? such a good question, too. Well, I know reporters like yourself and people that other kids listen to are good voices to provide accurate information. And you ask, coming here and asking tough questions um, is an important part of that. Um, I would say that, um, you know, one of the things that um, we encourage parents to do is, um, you know, make sure you are um, educating yourself on all of these platforms and what information is available and working with your kids to make sure they understand what's accurate and inaccurate. Uh, there are certainly steps the government can take, but uh, there's also an ongoing development of new tools and we as parents need to keep educating ourselves about what's out there so we can make sure our kids uh, have access to good information, informative information. We watch a lot of animal videos in my house. That's all good and positive um, and not access to information that's inaccurate uh, and misleading or, or or problematic. Go ahead. Thanks. It's much better than poor clients, so. <laughs> yeah. Hard, um, hard confirm. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, our friends at Reuters uh, reported that there's a new executive order being drafted to give HHS and DOJ new powers um, to block Chinese access to vulnerable, uh, to Americans' sensitive information. And so I was wondering if you could give a sense of timeline on this. But also the idea that there's been frustration with the administration, frustration within the administration over um, some of the slow walking of commerce on rulemaking and investigations, and that that may have prompted this uh, action by the president. Well. I would say that certainly the protection of the privacy of American citizens and ensuring that no uh, foreign actors, whether state-owned or otherwise, have access to the, the information of Americans is of utmost concern to the President, to our National Security Advisor, and others. Um, these processes can take some time uh, to develop, to investigate, to finalize. Um, it's not a surprise if there is a frustration by anyone who's a part of that process, but I can't speak to that uh, from here. Uh, but I can tell you certainly uh, ensuring we are protecting Americans' privacy is, is of utmost concern to the President. Um, a minister in the Bolsonaro government said that uh, he may skip the Summit of the Americas coming up because he wants to campaign. If he is not going, Mexico says that they may not go because Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua may not be invited. Are we reaching a point where this summit may no longer be successful because so many key leaders in the hemisphere, even though one's obviously the, the president's head, 
key disagreements with won't be attending. Well, no invitations have gone out for the summit. So um, that is obviously something that will happen in short order, given the summit is coming up in June. Um, I would note that uh, Secretary of State Tony Blinken spoke today with the, his uh, counterpart um, and reiterated not only his appreciation for the continued collaboration we have with Mexico, but also noted that a uh, special advisor for the summit uh, of the Americas, Christopher Dodd, will travel to Mexico later this month to further discuss preparations for the summit. So these conversations are ongoing. Obviously, important questions about what the final invitation list will look like. Uh, we are certainly eager to host the summit, um, something that um, that um, you know is our highest priority uh, for the hemisphere, and it would be an, an important opportunity to talk about a range of issues, including democracy, including climate goals, including the COVID-19 response, and addressing the root causes of migration. So we are fully planning and moving forward, but no final decisions about the invites have been made yet. And then the last one, there was a report earlier this week that uh, the president may be meeting with or speaking to the King of Jordan. Obviously, also, I think we asked last week about this possibility of a regional summit in um, Israel. So I'm wondering if you could confirm either of those things and specifically on the last point, whether Saudi Arabia is being weighed as a participant in that summit, oil production, obviously, a kind of primary concern for many Americans. Yes. Right okay. First, yes, he will be meeting with the King of Jordan. Um, I can get you the details of that after the briefing. Um, and on the second part of your question, I think you're referring to what his travel might look like in June around the other summits. We're still finalizing what that looks like. There have been good questions about whether or not he will go to Israel, given he has committed to Prime Minister or, or accepted the invitation of Prime Minister Bennett. Uh, but that trip, we're not quite there yet. We're still finalizing the next trip. Uh, we, we have had um, senior members of the national security team travel to Saudi Arabia to talk about a range of issues, including regional cooperation, obviously the war in Yemen, um, and uh, supply on the global marketplace, uh, but I don't have anything to predict in terms of an upcoming visit by the president. Go ahead. Yeah, back on infant formula, Senator Gillibrand in an interview with NPR said that this is a life or death issue and that the other companies aren't stepping up, they aren't producing as much formula as they should or could be, and that she's going to ask the president to invoke the Defense Production Act on this. Is that the, the kind of request that will be entertained? Yes, we are exploring every option. I think when you look at the Defense Production Act, you have to ensure that it would actually achieve what you're trying to achieve. And so we're also looking at that as well. And we have been working, this is one of the reasons, obviously, the president called CEOs today of some of these vital companies to determine what more can be done. Because we know that with one major supplier uh, having part of their supply off the marketplace, the one of the easiest and fastest ways to address that is to increase supply from a, some of the other suppliers um, and also to import more, which is a step we're working to take as well. They didn't happen to ask him to invoke the Defense Production Act, did they? When <laughs> I'm not aware of that being a specific ask from them. Um, I can see if there's more to read out from the, from the calls as okay. well. And, and just quickly on the COVID deaths, uh, going back to the, the group marked by COVID, they're also asking the president to meet with people who've lost loved ones, to you know, express his empathy and also sort of feel what they're feeling. Uh, when is the last time he met with the loved ones of people who've died from COVID, and, and would he consider such a meeting? He, he certainly would, and I think there, uh, even people who may not like the president or may, probably would not question his level of empathy um, and compassion for people who have lost loved ones. And certainly uh, addressing and talking about that impact is something you hear him do every time, nearly every time he talks about COVID. He certainly would be open to doing that. I, I don't have anything to predict in terms of the future schedule, but yes. Go ahead. Um, Jen, two of the, or some of the steps, at least two of them, two of them announced today on infant formula seem like things that could have been announced uh, in take steps that could have been taken earlier and any woman following uh, this on any mom's list or whatever has known of rumblings of this crisis since nearly the plant shut down in February. Why why did it take so long to announce the steps you announced? Well, again, some of these steps we've been working on just because we haven't been announcing them publicly, including increasing supply and working with producers and suppliers. Um, some of the challenges we're also seeing, let me just note it, and I noted this a little bit 
bit earlier is this uh, hoarding issue uh, and we are also have been also calling on re retailers to impose purchasing limits to prevent the possibility of hoarding because we know that that is an issue uh, again sometimes it's people who are fearful uh, but uh, which is understandable but also it is it is also there's an element of people who are trying to benefit financially off of that fear uh, which is where we have uh, a concern but since the recall, recall uh, we've been working nonstop to address and alleviate supply issues by working with these retailers, engaging with the FDA on additional steps we could take. Um, and obviously we're talking about laying all the specifics out now. Go ahead. Briefly uh, on a different topic um, of ultra mega. Now you saw Representative Lee Stefanik saying, I'm ultra mega and I'm proud of it. Former Trump super PAC uh, blasted out a t-shirt of him as an ultra mega Superman. Um, he on his own Twitter alternative platform released a meme of him as the ultra MAGA king. I guess I'm curious what the administration makes of Republicans and the former president sort of co-opting this and, and elevating what President Biden clearly intended as a pejorative. Well, I, I think if that means that uh, the individuals you mentioned are embracing their opposition to a woman's right to make choices about her own health care, if they're embracing a plan that will late raise taxes on uh, 75 million Americans, if they're embracing the importance of fighting Mickey Mouse over virtually any other issue, I guess that's their platform. Good for them. We're happy to have a debate about that. Go ahead. Um, Jen, at the risk of um, sending you back to uh, your State Department days, I was wondering if you could come back to um, the embrace of Sweden and uh, sure. Finland for NATO and walk us through the distinction now between their qualifications and Ukraine now that we have invested so much more heavily in uh, making sure that Ukraine remains an independent state and that it irreversibly could not be um, invaded again. Well, I would leave that to my NATO spokesperson colleague to speak to. What I would say, David, is that um, what we support is a NATO application by Finland or Sweden should they choose to apply. Uh, we know that they have been close and valued defense partners. There are a range of requirements I'm sure my NATO counterparts could speak to, um, including uh, addressing a range of issues like corruption and how you would participate in the defense of the uh, collective NATO alliance. Um, but I will let them to speak speak to that. We, of course, support uh, the NATO's, NATO's open door policy and the aspirations of any country to apply to join. Um, but I think this speaks to our longstanding uh, relationship uh, and military partnerships with Finland and Sweden. So you're saying that for um, Finland and Sweden, you're supporting their application, that their right to apply, but you're not embracing yet whether or not you would actually... We would support a NATO application by Finland and Sweden, yes. Okay. And then take that um, the next step for us, if you can, which is to say that um, you've heard what the Russians have, how they've reacted uh, to this. Um, Given the debate that took place back in the 15, 20 years ago about expanding NATO and uh, the president's concerns at that time, um, does he think that expanding it again just risks further provocation here? And is that is is the benefit at this point of having them in the alliance greater than the risk of the provocation? Well, I would go. I would just like to quote the president of Finland uh, and what he said, which I don't think I could state it better uh, in response to this question, which is, as it relates to Russia, you caused this. Look at the mirror, um, and uh, you know that is uh, NATO is a defensive alliance. It's not an offensive alliance. Uh, both um, Finland and Sweden are close and valued defense partners of the United States and NATO. They're thriving democracies. They've worked closely with NATO for years. There's no aggressive intent from NATO, from the United States, from Finland or Sweden. Obviously, they can speak for themselves to Russia. Uh, but again, uh, this is President Putin who caused this. Look at the mirror. Um, and I think that also probably is the reason for what you've seen as public support for joining NATO increase in these countries as well. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Um, one on the COVID summit, and then if I can, a follow-up. Sure. Tam was asking about the DPA. Uh, during the summit today, did the U.S. hear any concerns from other countries about the delay in securing U.S. funding for the global effort, or that there's a potential that that funding will not come through if Congress doesn't move forward on it? 
I don't have a thorough readout on it to point you to other countries to speak to what they did or didn't express. I would note that the Vice President, in her comments, specifically highlighted the need to get additional funding, including the $5 billion that is up for international COVID relief, which is part of the $22.5 we requested. And she did that because there's a recognition, acknowledgement, that we want to continue to be part of this effort, to continue to lead this effort. And without that funding, uh, we won't be as well positioned. Um, I would note that what is a success from this summit is, of course, the fact that we have been able to um, put together $3.2 billion in contributions from a range of countries attending uh, to this global effort, and that is part of was part of the purpose to ensure that we were um, elevating this, uh, uh, working together, coordinating, um, you know, to prevent uh, complacency, to prevent deaths, to prevent uh, and plan for future variants. And that kind of money from other countries um, is an important step forward. And to follow up on the DPA question, obviously baby formula is a very specific product, but is there a lesson that can be learned from the COVID supplies of PPE and vaccines and scaling up production that the administration could apply to this situation right now? Uh, that's a very good question, Karen. I think one of the challenges in the cycle of the supplies here is that um, c companies are going to produce what the, the market needs, right? And if you look at things like um, tests or masks, um, you know, back in the fall, remember, we had a shortage of tests. The, sp the summer, we had an abundance of tests to the point where companies were shutting down manufacturing. So the challenge is, is that it's about what the demand is in the marketplace. And obviously now there's high demand because there's a shortage because of this recall, which was done again to save babies' lives. Um, and you know clearly our efforts and focus now is on increasing supply from other suppliers and importing more so that we can meet the current demand and needs now. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, another one on uh, baby formula. There are families uh, with babies who are sick and relying on specialty mix yeah. uh, that I understand and are only manufactured in this uh, plant that is offline now. So what's the plan for, for those families? I, I addressed this a little bit um, yesterday or the day before. I guess it was the day before, which is part of our effort is to ensure and work with other suppliers who can ma who make a baby formula who can meet the same needs of um, children who have special needs or who have specific needs for what formula they can take to ensure that supplies on the marketplace as well. Uh, on, on, on this whole, and the uh, FDA has been doing that, but go ahead. On this whole supply chain issue, uh, we often hear the president saying uh, the solution to supply chain problems is to produce in the United States. In this case, we have a product that is manufactured, I think, 98% uh, in the United States. So how uh, do you reconcile these two messages? You know, well, America? because the, the reason for this shortage is not because there was a supply chain issue in a foreign country. That's a different issue. That's one supply chain issue. This issue is because there was unsafe product that the FDA recalled to save babies' lives. So it's just a different issue. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, a senior acoustician official yesterday said that the president's trip to South Korea and Japan later this month is part uh, part of his plan for quad policy. And he's the first administration to raise it to the uh, leadership level. That the president has plans to visit other two countries, quad countries, India and Australia, and when that is going to be. I'm sure he will in the future, but we have two foreign trips we're still trying to finalize at this point, um, and so I don't have any predictions about when. Is going to be the first term of the president? I, I can't make a prediction of that, but there's a lot of time left in the first term, so that's the good news. A lot of time yeah. for travel. And the second question, uh, what is U.S. expectations from, the, from India on the two wars the world is fighting one is the Ukraine war other than the COVID-19. Well, we continue to remain in close touch with India about um, you know, our uh, efforts to rally the world, to stand up against Russian aggression. That means implementing and abiding by sanctions that have been put in place. And as you know, D uh, Dalip took a trip, our, our Deputy National Security Advisor took a trip just a few weeks ago there to have a conversation about that. Uh, we continue to encourage countries to speak out about Russian aggression. And obviously on COVID-19, uh, we've been an important partner with India in providing supply and vaccines and needs uh, in their times of need over the course of the last 15 months, and certainly we'll continue to work with them on that. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Uh, one on Finland, one on Israel. Um, when, uh, when Russia threatened military technical means against Ukraine many months ago, you were sounding the alarm bells, you were giving very specific uh, projections as to what the Russians were going to do. Uh, they invoked that term again uh, after Finland's announcement. 
What do you make of it? Um, what are your concerns uh, about Russia's response to this? About Russia's con uh, Finnish application for NATO membership? Well, I would say that the facts are important here, which is that NATO is a defensive alliance. Uh, NATO has no aggressive intent against, against Russia, not, nor does the United States, nor do Finland and Sweden. Uh, we have all long supported, before the invasion, after the invasion, the open door policy, and certainly given uh, Finland and Sweden are have long-standing important uh, partnerships with the United States, with NATO countries, their uh, long-standing democracies, uh, that's why we support uh, their application. But uh, you know, beyond that, I think it's important to note what the facts are here, which is that there's no aggressive intent. At all. On the uh, on the killing of uh, Shireen Abarafa uh, in Janine, um, you called for an investigation, uh, uh, a swift investigation. I guess the question is, what kind of investigation? The Israelis uh, have uh, extended an offer for the Palestinians to participate in a joint investigation. Should they be accepting that offer? And they've also uh, asked for U.S. Uh, oversight over um, uh, some examination of. For, for example, the bullet uh, that killed uh, Shireen. Um, you know, what have you responded to that offer? Uh, what would you like to see? Well, we understand that both Israel and the Palestinian Authority are already conducting investigations into the circumstances of the killing. We encourage both parties to do so thoroughly and transparently and to share their findings to ensure that all evidence in this case is available and fully assessed. Uh, we stand ready to assist either party in any way that we can. Uh, neither side has asked for our assistance at this time, uh, and such a request would be required in order for us to do so. Go ahead. Um, so as part of this Ultramaga rollout, um, the President has talked a lot about sort of what the Republican, what he thinks the Republican Party now stands for. He's also, you know, thrown out some tough language, saying they were petty and mean-spirited and sort of cow cowering to uh, former President Trump. Does he, um, and, but he's also said he's been surprised by that. Does he still feel like the fever will break in Washington? Well, I, you mean in terms of the ultra-MAGA followers of the former president? If, if ultra-MAGA, you know, as he says, controls the party, that would be the party that he thought would come around. Well, I just want to make sure I'm understanding your question. Are you asking me if he thinks that there will ever be a period of time where there will not be a ultra MAGA party, or if we does he does he feel like there will be a period in time when he is president in which um, the ultra MAGA wing of the Republican Party doesn't control it and that the fever will break in Washington? Well, that's certainly his hope. Um, the president has long believed that Democrats and Republicans can work together, can work together to get things done. He signed 80 bipartisan bills into law last year. Uh, the Bipartisan Innovation Act is something we're still working to get through. And his view is that uh, this is a conversation, a lot of it's happening in Washington, and they are, um, uh, for the American people and the American public, a lot of these policies that the ultra MAGA wing, the MAGA king, all the different terminology where uh, the president's using out there, is not aligned with their, where the vast majority of the public is. And elected officials should be doing what the vast majority of the public wants them to do. Um, does the White I, and excuse me if you guys have already reacted to this, does the White House have a uh, comment on the latest round of uh, subpoenas uh, by the January 6th? We, we certainly support the work of the January 6th committee. We'll continue to support their work. We believe it's vital and essential to get to the bottom of what happened on January 6th, one of the darkest days in our democracy. So we'll continue to support their work. Go ahead. Okay, last one. Go ahead. Jen, um, staying on Ultra MAGA and the, the Rick Scott. Uh, stuff, yeah. Obviously, the president himself is not subject to the Hatch Act, but as the midterms start to take over basically everything, can you just talk about how the White House is navigating the distinction between uh, political speech and official events? For the pres and what the president is doing, or or how he spends his time. In terms of the appropriateness of making explicitly political or campaign-focused messages during official White House events. Well, I, I would say that um, I am subject to the Hatch Act, as I've noted um, in a sternly written letter to me. Um, but the president um, is not, as you know, um, and he is the leader of the Democratic Party. He's also the commander in chief. He's also the leader of the free world. 
Um, and what he is pointing out is what he sees to be a troubling trend in our, in our country. That's a threat to our democracy, a threat to progress. And certainly, he's going to continue to draw the contrast uh, for the American people on what the options present. All right, I'm just going to do Patsy in April because I, Patsy, go ahead. Uh, Jen, so uh, on the U.S.-ASEAN summit, can you give us uh, a sense of how hard the president will push on the issue of Ukraine? For example, whether the administration will be pushing to include the word Russia in the final communique. As you know, ASEAN have so far avoided using that word uh, on any of their statements on the Ukraine crisis. And I have a follow-up on Afghanistan, if you don't mind. Sure. So on the ASEAN summit, Ukraine will absolutely be on the agenda in terms of what the final communique will look like. I don't expect it will be ready for more than 24 hours, and there's lots of conversations that need to happen between now and then, so I can't make a prediction of it. But I will say that a number of the ASEAN participants have been important partners in calling out uh, the aggressive action of Russia in invading Ukraine, in participating and supporting sanctions, and certainly abiding by them. Um, and obviously the conflict we're seeing is a, a unique unique moment in, in modern global history. So it will certainly be on the agenda. Okay, go ahead, last thing, and I'll go to April, and then i got to go. Can you confirm reports that Jake Sullivan recently met with the chief of the Pakistani spy agency in Washington, D.C.? Can you share anything from that meeting and whether the two sides discuss uh, counterterrorism cooperation in Afghanistan? I don't have any details on that reported meeting. I can certainly check and see if there's more. Okay, April, wrap it up. Yes, wrapping it up. Um, I need to share on another meeting, if you can sure. share some more information. Uh, Congressman Greg Meeks, the chair of the House Foreign Affairs uh, Committee, met with the president, was part of a group meeting with the president this week, and he talked about uh, issues that he talked with, uh, was it uh, President Yelensky? And one of those issues that President Yelensky specifically brought up to Meeks and the contingent was uh, Ukrainian grains and how it is impacting the lack of Ukrainian grains going out to the world. It's impacting Africa. Meek said the president spoke about it. Can you drill down a little bit more about this? As the president has said he wants it to go out to the world, he drilled down a little bit more, especially when it comes to Africa, because there is a concern about many of those countries, to include Ethiopia and Congo, yeah. that's already going through crisis. Yeah, it's an important issue. We're seeing food shortages in the world, including in parts of Africa, other parts of the Middle East. Um, this is one of the reasons why the president went to Chicago and raised the issue of doing everything we can to increase supply here in the United States. Well, we don't expect shortages here. We want to be providers of American grains to the rest of the world, as we're seeing shortages in part because of the war in Ukraine. We've also provided a large amount of assistance to global food programs, global aid programs, in anticipation of what we see as a potential shortage of food, and we'll continue to do work on it. Here's yeah. the president more pause. The president Yelinsky himself brought that issue of grain for Africa, specifically Africa. The continent. Well, we are working on this issue and have been working on this issue for months now. Um, that is, the president went on a trip just yesterday to elevate and talk about the steps we're taking to increase supply of grains and wheat here in the United States to address exactly this issue. And we are far and away the world's largest provider of assistance and aid to global food programs in order to address what we know could be a shortage around the world. Thank you, everyone. Jen, how did you prepare for